All right. Are we ready for the word? Yeah. Good. That's much better. <laughs> That's much better. Okay, so can anyone remind me what we're talking about? Yes. I feel like some people are resting more than others. <laughs> and it's cheating. <laughs> it looks like some people are resting more than others. Can't believe someone who didn't even come to church last week was busy posting on Facebook as we have been talking in, in church about rest and he's posting pictures from Cyprus. We are resting, we are listening to the pastor. <laughs> that's Pastor Simon too. <laughs> well, that's part of the rest we're talking about. <laughs> Amen. You need those kind of rest. <laughs> we need to give our physical body rest, please. So we're talking about rest. And uh, this is the third part of, fourth part of that, mostly because of how slow I am in delivering the word. Um, but we thank God for that. Okay, so rest is what? The way to the way to receive God's promise. By now, can anyone tell me why is that a way to receive God's promise? I, can anyone just shout it out? Why is rest the way to receive God's promise? Because it's faith. It's faith. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You guys got it. It's faith. It's because it means that you're, you're trusting Him to do it. You're trusting Him to do it. You're not trying to work it out to yourself. That's good. Okay, so last week we only touched a little bit, but we hopefully we'll carry on from that. I only gave us one point, but our text last week was this. Let's read it out loud. Go. So there is still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest, have rested from their labors, just as God's people have waited for So that's our text. Okay, but I like. That statement, all who have rested from, has entered God's rest, have done what? Rested, rested from their labors. And I asked us the question last week, if you can remember. What's that question? Have I? Rested from my That's a question to ask yourself. Have I rested from my labors? And why do we ask that question? It's because all who have entered, and we said anyone who believes in Jesus and in this room, <coughs> you have already entered God's rest. Okay? And I'm saying, I'm repeating that just for those who are, we have newcomers today as well. <laughs> oh, well oh, newcomers, but old comers, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Thanks for being here, by the way. Yeah. You used to visit us at uh, Blaine. It's good to see you. Okay. So, those who have, all of us who have entered, anyone who belongs to Jesus have done what? Entered into rest. So the question is, have I rested from my level? Or levels or am I still trying to fix? That's the key question here. My problems by my own strength. And Dave asked, bro, Dave asked an important question last week, which is: so what you're saying by resting, resting from your levels doesn't mean doing nothing. And it doesn't mean that. Okay? And that's why I highlighted today for us, labors means you trying to work it out. It doesn't mean not doing anything. Am I, are we together? Yeah. God. It's me trying to fix my problem, me trying to work out what God has said will happen, then I'm not resting from my labors because I'm not staying where I'm supposed to stay, which is in Christ Jesus. So like I said, Last week, whenever we start trying to fix our problems, we start behaving as the children of Israel. When we start to try to fix our own problem, we enter into those kind of issues. The children of Israel did that it, so many times in the wilderness. Every time they try to fix their problem by themselves without God, they end up in all kinds of problems. And so last week we talked about one, I gave us one point, shout it out before I show you. The first point last week, anyone? Okay. I'm going to wait for someone to shout it out. Good. Accept what? Why am I doing? Why am I? Why? You know why I'm 
teaching us this way. I'm not teaching us like a big church. We're a small church. We should have more interaction when we have our services. Yeah? And also, I don't know what it is with me. Maybe I have this more of a teaching grace than a preaching grace. Um, a preaching grace, I'll just tell you what I need to tell you. Get you excited, get you inspired, and we go home. You give me a high five. What a powerful message that was. That's awesome. Fist pump and all of those things. No, I'm not concerned about God. I'm more concerned about you understanding what we're talking about. I'm more concerned about you growing. I'm more concerned about what can I say to us later, earlier. Us going to our home churches and discussing this and saying, but, but hang on a minute, is that really true? What Pastor King said, is it really true? Or even try to do it, prove it. Or prove it through the scripture. Amen. Okay, so accept God's promises. That means embrace His word. Embrace, I said to us, means cling to for your dear life. Hold on to it. The question I should ask ourselves, why should I embrace his promise? Why should I cling to it? Because God will do what he said he would do. Now, if it was my wife or, or, or any human being that gave me a word, I may not cling to it unless that person has proven themselves. When someone proves themselves to you, then when they say to you, I'll see you in the morning, you might as well just get ready because they will see, you see them in the morning. Some people, they'll tell you, I'll see you by 5 o'clock. You know that there's no way they will ever be there by 5 o'clock. So you can just relax a little bit because they're always going to call you maybe 15 minutes to 5. They call you and say, I'm running 10 minutes late. So you set your clock to that. Yeah? Okay, and I asked us a question last week. The question we want to ask yourself is, do I know God's promises to me? Because if, it's, if, if the how to rest in God's promise is by accepting his promise, then do I even know his promise? If that point one is true, then if I don't know his past promise, present promise, future promise, then I will be struggling with resting. Why do I break it down in past, present, and future? Past is the things that he has already done for us on the cross of Calvary. It covers your present as well. But if I don't know that he said I will heal you, when I'm sick, I will not rest. I don't have anything to hold on to that will give me rest. Now, if I don't know his promise to me right now, what he said to me about my son or my daughter, um, you know, or my marriage or my, you know, my finances, my health and all of that. Whenever any situation, any challenge in that area, I will panic. Yeah? If I don't know, if God has spoken to you about your son or your daughter and said, this child will be this, that's a present. I consider that present, even though it might still be in the future. But when I say present, I'm talking about your lifetime here on earth. Yeah? Your lifetime here on earth. And then your future, afterlife. Do you know his promise? Do you know what is awaiting for you? The pleasures, the glory that is awaiting for you. If you know how secure that is, it puts you to rest. But if you don't know how secure that is, anytime you tell a lie or you make a mistake, you panic, boy, good heavens, I'm going to hell. You understand what I'm saying now? So you're basing, anytime you take your eyes off his promises, it leads to panic. Just, that's the body I want you to get. It leads to panic. So we, ex we experience God's rest by holding on to his revealed promises. His revealed promises is how we rest. 
Hold on to it. Why should you do that? Because whatever God reveals he will do, he will do. It doesn't matter how long, he will do it. And let me give us, let me just read the scripture for us. In the book of Genesis, if you turn your Bibles to Genesis, if you have your Bible, or click, flick, whatever app you're using for Bible, Genesis chapter 41, it will still be on the screen. Verse 25, Joseph said something I liked so much. And he was talking to Pharaoh when he said this thing. Joseph said to Pharaoh, Joseph responded, he said, both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. Does anyone know the story of Joseph, um, story of, uh, no, what's his name? <laughs> Pharaoh having a dream about, about famine coming in the land and all of that. Good. Okay, if you don't know it, I encourage you to read the book of Genesis yourself and you, it's beautiful. Read from maybe about chapter, Genesis chapter 39, 39 or something thereabouts. Okay? Okay, so verse, he says, Joseph responded, both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. And how did God tell Pharaoh in advance what he's about to do? Dreams. Okay. Watch verse 28. This is interesting. Read it go. This will happen just as I described it. Why? For God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. Can you take note of that statement from Joseph? Joseph said, this will happen exactly as I said it will happen. Why? It's not about Joseph because Joseph said it. It's not because he prophesied. You know, like, oh, let me give you a word of prophecy. I prophesied to you that this will happen. No, no, no. It's not because I prophesied. If I am prophesying and it's not what he said, he has revealed you will do, forget it. It's not going to happen. You can't build on that. You can't bank on it. Does that make sense? So that's why I'm saying you take note of the word. This will happen because it will happen exactly. Why? Because he has shown you what he's about to do. Question. Who here has God given a promise? Raise your hand. You can. So God has revealed to you what he is about to do. Can you speak like Joseph and say, it will happen exactly as he has revealed it? That's what the issue is here. Is that sometimes God gives us a promise. It looks too far-fetched. It looks too ridiculous. And so we just put it on the back burner. We just don't focus on it. We let go of it and focus on that which matters. You know, the immediate thing that is, we're facing. And things like that. We forget that that promise should be what is determining what we're doing now. That promise should determine what I'm, how I'm behaving, should determine my behavior right now. But if you're waiting for your behavior to change when the promise is fulfilled, forget it, it doesn't work that way. Your behavior will have to change, will have to be determined by the word of God and his promise. Okay, now, just in case someone will say, maybe you're watching online and you say, well, <laughs> well, Pastor King, thank you for, you guys are favor houses, you're awesome, God is always giving all of you promises, you all have a word or two to share with one another, I haven't received a promise from God, let me give you one, and that's why I say, remember, past, present, and future promise. So before anyone say, I haven't heard any particular specific word from God, 
Here's a word from God. And that's for you. And to you. Don't love money. In the book of Hebrews chapter 13. It says, but be satisfied with what? Why? Let's say that now. For I will never fail you and I will never abandon you. So let me ask again. Who here has received the promise from God? If you're not raising your hand, it's because you don't believe. Or if you don't accept that, it's because you don't think that the word of God is to you. This is full of promises to God's children. And you know what I found out? The more I accept the, the past promises done on the cross, then the more I receive yes. the present promise of how I will wake up and get up and then do the next thing and then do the next thing. Please, I make an appeal. No part of the message. Prioritize this. Oh, man. Do not play down the word of God. Don't reason it out. Find yourself in every page. No matter how bad the page is, think, what can I learn from this? What is God saying to me in this? Praise God. The word of God is for you. So that's God's promise to you. That scripture didn't finish there. It says, so you can say with confidence. So because of that promise, you can say with confidence what? The Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. I can go and sleep because the Lord is my helper. You see what I'm saying about accept God's promises is a way to rest. If you don't accept his promise, if you don't accept his word for you, it will be difficult to rest because you have nothing to that triggers the rest itself. It's his promise. This is the basis, his word. This is the basis for the promise for the rest. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. You know, some American preacher will say, I think I'm preaching, I'm, pre I'm preaching good. <laughs> and they will say to you, they will say, your, your shout is not as loud as uh, their preaching is. But it's not about the shout, it's about you internalizing this. And taking this every single word I'm saying serious. Because it's not me saying, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Embrace his word. Turn to your neighbor and say, embrace his word. Look at somebody, look at them with the eyes and embrace his promise. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Okay? Hold on to it. Maybe someone might say, but hang on a minute, maybe that's just Paul or the writer of Hebrew just saying something that's not to me anyway. It's not directly to me. Here's a word to Jesus from Jesus himself. But this time he's calling on you and calling on all of us. Jesus said this, oh, this is interesting. Remember I started that scripture by saying, do not love money. Why did I highlight? Do you notice I highlighted do not love money? You notice I highlighted that? Underlined, rather. Why? What, what's the connection? That's an interesting thing. What's the connection with do not love money first? Well, it's a strange statement to make. Think of it quickly. Why did he have to say, first of all, do not love money? It's because our confidence is in money. Mm -hmm. 
We think, well, if I have money, then all my problems are gone. You know, if I have money, I'll be able to help many more people. No, 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 it's not true. You know, if I have money, then I'll be able I'll feel like much better. I can buy a better house, move in a quieter place, then I can have rest. It's a lie. If that's true, then there will never be any rich person committing suicide. Praise God. It's because that's what our heart yearns for. And he says, don't focus on that. Hold on to what I have said. I will be with you. I will help you. I will protect you. You will not have need to fear about anything <coughs> about him because I will be with you and I will never abandon you. Money will abandon you. How would money abandon you? Until you get cancer and you realize that money cannot solve it. You can have all the chemotherapy you can have and they will still say, oh, I'm so sorry. You only have six months. Money has just abandoned you. Praise God. But for someone who says, oh, maybe God hasn't given me a promise. Here's the one from Jesus. At that time, Jesus said in the book of Matthew, verse chapter 11, he, said, he prayed this prayer. Oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves what? Wise and clever. The issue here is when we do not hearken to his word, we think ourselves wise and clever. But what have you done? You're revealing your promises to those who are like children, childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. In other words, this is the kingdom way. This is not our, it's not a, but God is not fair. It, do, that's, it doesn't, don't even do fair with God. He's his star. He's his kingdom. He's in charge. It's not like King Charles that is a king but have no really authority, proper authority over many things. He is a king completely in charge of everything. It pleased the Father to have it this way. Then, then Jesus, after saying that, guess what Jesus now said? Come to me. All of you who are weary and are carrying heavy burden, and I will do what? Thank you. So in other words, there's no way to get that rest except you come to Jesus. And he goes on to say, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Back again to, don't be wise in your own eyes. Hold on to my word. Listen to my word. Hold on to my promise. Let me teach you. And if I teach you, what would you find? You will find rest for your soul. If you will hold on to my word, in, Matthew, in John chapter 15, he says, abide in my word. If I if I abide in me and I abide in you, and if I, you abide in my word, and you will bear fruit. And whatever you ask the Father, he will give it to you. Praise God. Oh, and he now goes on to say, for what? My yoke is easy to bear, to, to carry. It's not difficult. Just accept it. Hold on to it. Friends, this leads us nicely to point number two. Point number two, apply God's word. How do you rest? Apply God's word. What does that mean? Employ godly wisdom. Employ godly wisdom. Apply his word. It's one thing to accept it. It's, some, it's another thing to do something with that. As you can see, I said already earlier, Jesus said, take my yoke. The word take means you're doing something. Yeah? So even though we're saying, have you rested from your labors? We're not saying rested from doing, rested <coughs> means doing nothing. We're saying, have you rested from doing your own things? Because what he says, take my own yoke. Keep yours. So you need to rest from your own plans and your own agendas and your own way of solving your problem. That's what you want to rest from. 
Because when you take up his own yoke, it's easy. His body is light. You still gonna be doing things, but this time you're doing things from a place of peace, completely at rest. And the world around you might look like they're just going bonkers, but you're in a different place. Amen. You are completely in a different place. My goodness, that's where we're going. Hallelujah. Gosh, I'm getting excited already. The dictionary meaning for wisdom is that like this. I've always believed this. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Of what use is it to get knowledge and do nothing with it? If you get knowledge and you do nothing with it, you know what it's called? that person is called? Not my words because it might sound harsh. It's the Bible. No, the Bible calls it fool. <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the book of uh, Romans said it thinking although they knew him as God in the book of Romans chapter 1 so they know, know they have a knowledge although they knew him as God they chose not to worship him they chose not to recognize him as God so thinking they are wise they became fools so when you have a knowledge of the word of God and you decide not to do something with that word you become foolish with knowledge. And so that's why I was talking about apply wisdom. Employ wisdom. Wisdom, this is dictionary, this is not King James now. It says, wisdom is the ability to use knowledge in order to make sensible decisions. So in other words, decision actions that I'm taking, if it's not coming from the knowledge of his word, then it's you know what I mean? You've already received an experience, you had an experience, you received the word. Let that determine your decision making. Let that determine how you run your business, how you run your family, how you run your wife and your relationships, how you fellowship with people. That's how we rest. This is not rest hanging in the air somewhere. This is rest hanging in his word. Praise the Lord. Wow. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give us examples. We're going to look at two examples. Or maybe three. In this point number two. We're going to look at an example of two individuals or people who received God's word. One, this group applied wisdom. And the other did nothing with it. Let's look at that. First, from people who don't even know God, or who are not supposed not to know God. Look at what they did with the word of God when they received it. The book of Jonah. When the king of Nineveh, Nineveh, did I say that right? Nineveh, heard what Jonah was saying. So Jonah was giving a word of prophecy from God to him. He did what? He stepped note of these actions. He stepped down from his throne. What is that? Suggest. He left his own agenda, his own plans, his own ego, and all of those things. He left all of that. He stepped down from his throne and he took off his robe. His pride played it down. He, had, he dressed himself in burlap and set on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles, so in other words, he didn't just do it. He started by a leader of leading by example. Then he got all his men and women to do the same. And then they released a decree that everyone in his hometown, in that city, should not eat, including animals may not eat or drink anything. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning. Wow, how does animals wear garments of mourning? Just, just pause for a minute and let's just have fun with that image. Cows wearing garments of mourning. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I can understand chihuahuas putting garments on them. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know how they would do that with camels and very interesting. Let everyone wear garments of mourning, and everyone must do what? Pray, Pray and 
earnestly, none of us take an action based on the word. So we're not just praying because we want to pray, we're praying because we heard something from God. Take note of that. That's what I call wisdom. The word from God came, it's triggered our decision making. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Watch this. This is where it gets exciting. He is doing all of this. He's not even sure the outcome will be. But he does know this is the right thing to do based on what we've heard. Watch what he said. Who can tell? Perhaps, even yet, God may ch will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. God just said to him, I will kill all of you. It wasn't a promise of wonderful promise. It wasn't a promise I will bless all of you. It's amazing. Is it not interesting that even when God promises us that he will bless us, we let go of it. We don't even hold on to it. We don't do anything with regards to that. But this is the promise of doom, which is easy for you to discard and say, who's this Jonah? Who, who does he think he is? Just, just go and sit down. No. He said, perhaps that God might change his mind and not kill us. And guess what? Miracle. Good news. Watch this. When God saw what they had done. Let's say loud. What they had done. Not just what they thought. God saw their action based on his word. What did he do? <laughs> okay. um, and he said what? He says, oh, let me go back again. When God saw what they had done and how they, how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he did what? He changed, his mind. he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Praise God. What caused this people to experience peace and rest? Say it loud. What caused these people to experience peace? Their action in accordance to the word of God. In accordance to the word of God. But would you act if you have not first of all accepted the promise? Point number one and point number two. If you don't accept the promise and hold on to it, why would you act? There's no need to act. So that's why point number one becomes very important. You have to first of all believe that this promise is for me. That word is for me. And God will do what he said he would do. Then I now need to then, okay God, what do I need to do in line with what you have said? Praise God. If God says to you, I will lift up, I will, I will cause you to become um, a fisher of men. I will bless your business and I will use you to bring many to Christ. Yeah? That's what God said to you that he'll do. First of all, you do what? You accept that. After accepting it in your now, every single time you pray, you should be now saying, God, you said you will use me to bring many to Christ. What should I do? I hope I'm in the light, right place. Tell me anything you want me to do, I'll do it. Praise God. That's what we're talking about. Apply wisdom. Okay? Apply wisdom. Hallelujah. Okay, so. Um, okay, I'll give us another example. This time, an opposite. Unfortunately, this time, this is a, supposed to be a Christian. Oh, well, I say Christian. <laughs> you can't be Christian because it's before Christ. But this one is a priest, a servant of God, who's so eager to hear God's word. Take note of what I say. So eager to hear God's word. Oh, give us a prophecy. Do you know it has happened today? People want to hear God prophesy to them, give them a word. Oh, what was God saying to you? Pastor, what is God saying to you about me? That's one good side, to hear what God is saying. But what you do with that? Is the more important thing 
than just what God is saying. So here's a priest who wants to know what God is saying. But here's the situation, what he did with it. The book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, in chapter 3, verse, from verse 10. And the Lord came to and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. That's the young Samuel who's working under a man of God called Eli. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do a shocking thing in Israel. So again, God is revealing what he's going to do. The same way he did with Jonah. I am going to carry out all my threats against Eli and his family. So in other words, this threat has been going on. From the beginning to the end, I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because of who? In other words, Eli is not the problem. So the issue here is not Eli. It's not like Eli is not a bad person. He's a good man. But God has given him a word that will affect him and Israel at the end of the day. But what? And then their son, and he hasn't done what? He's done nothing with that. So I have vowed that the sin of Eli, so now God is not put him in the sin. So what is this guy saying now? For not acting in line with the word of God. Okay. Friends, like, did I tell you that Eli and lost hearing God's word? So this is what he's saying to Samuel. Now here's what happened with Eli. So Samuel stayed in bed until morning. Then he got up and opened the door for the, of the tabernacle as usual. He was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord said to him. But Eli called out to him, Samuel, my son, here, I'm, here I am. Um, Samuel replied, What did the Lord say to you? Tell me what? Everything. Everything. And may God strike you and even kill you if, if you hide anything from me. So he's so eager to hear the word of God. He's so eager to, he doesn't want to miss any word of God, any promises from God. And then, you now think that someone who says all of that would do anything with that. But no, friends, look at what he did. So someone told Eli everything, he didn't hold back anything. And guess what Eli said? Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. What do you call that? Let me say that loud. Thank you. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. When we are talking about rest, we're not talking about que sera, sera. Jesus said he will bless me, so yeah, he will bless me. What is it saying to you to do in line with the blessing that is coming your way. Praise God. What is he saying to you? What am I supposed to be doing in line with that? <coughs> he says, it is the Lord's will. Eli he replied, let him do what he wants to do. And God did what he wanted to do. Which involved killing the man and his children. And now he the whole family. Took him off the picture. I have more than I'm out of time. <laughs> I can feel the weight you're feeling. And it's, we're supposed to feel that way. I'm going to read one more and then we'll close. Now, here is a, someone who doesn't know God or who's having 300 or 50, who are, how many other gods? But when God said to him through Joseph, what did he do? This is Pharaoh. 
So, Joseph is the one talking to Pharaoh. He says, as for if having two similar dreams, it means that this event will be, have been decreed by God and it will soon happen. If God decrees a thing, he will do it. Therefore, based on the word, Pharaoh should find an intelligent, this is wisdom. You see what I'm saying? Pharaoh should do what? Pharaoh shouldn't hear this and just sit down and say, okay, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. What God said to Pharaoh is that there will be seven years where there will be abundance in your land. But after that, there's coming another seven years where you have come a fat famine in the whole world that we have never seen before. If he said, que sera, sera, what will be, will be, he will just enjoy seven years of abundance and then when the next seven years of family come, all of them will die. And so this is what we do sometimes. And God will give us a promise. Que sera, sera, what will be, will be, the time will come and then the time will pass for the promise to happen. Because we didn't listen to him and stay with him and find out what he wants us to do with the promise. And so he said, select, don't sit down, Pharaoh. Find someone intelligent, put him in charge of everything. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors all over the land and let them collect 50 and all of those things. So Pharaoh asked his official. Pharaoh did not say, Who are you? This small boy. You're a Jewish. I don't care about you. Let's sit down. I'm Pharaoh. I'm, remember, Pharaoh is God, by the way, to his people. You know that? No. To their people, this they, they worship Pharaoh as God. Yeah. Um, go and check the history. No, he's, he's worshipped as God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay, so that's a topic for home church. Argument for home church. I have my home church people saying, No way, no, Pharaoh is not there. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. My point in there is to say, He would have said, No, I'm God over this nation. So, which God are you talking about? Go and sit down. But no. He listened immediately and said, can we find another a man so full of Holy Spirit like this? He understands there's a bigger God there. Then Pharaoh said to his Joseph, since God has revealed, I love this, since God has done by revealing this, um, these dreams to you, no one else is intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all of my people will take orders from you then um, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Why did I say this? Here's what I'm trying to say. The more we do what God wants, the more we experience His rest. The more you act in line with His word, the more you experience rest. The more we walk against God, the less rest we will experience. I think it's a good place to stop for today. You get it? The Bible, the, the book of Isaiah 48 was giving us promise. Promise and promise of what God is, how God is going to release and deliver Israel. And at the bottom of that, after saying all those wonderful things he's going to say, he says that there's no rest for the wicked. There's no peace for those for the wicked, who's the wicked? The people who don't hear his word, who go against his word. Praise God. We want to be people who hear his promises and hold on to it. I still have one more point, but we can't fix with that in today, sadly. Oh. <laughs> um, because if I try to squeeze it in and mention it, it's just, we, we need to do proper justice. Because that one is also very important. Amen. Amen. Have you learned something? Has the Holy Spirit spoken to you at all? So far, how do you experience God's rest? Accept His promise. Embrace His word. Hold on to that promise. Please, please. Remind yourself. Write it down. Write it down. Go back to it and remind yourself over and over. Every now and then. And then number two, 
every now and then bring it to him and say, God, you said to me that you will bless my children. I, I hope I'm raising them the way you want me to raise them. Help me to raise them in line with how you want me to raise them. In other words, your prayers now in line with your his promise. Not what the government said. Not what your neighbor is doing. Not what they tell you, oh, well, it's a teenager. Every teenager will have to lose their way. No, no, not based on all those things. It's based on the promises given to you. Father, we thank you. Let's stand up. We give you praise.